teaching no. I don't know about other classes, but um, not no. I mean, I, if we do, I'll, I will be providing you with the section or whatever we need. So the United States Constitution um, as we discovered in the earlier chapters, constitutions are kind of the framework or groundwork by which the laws of a nation are established. Okay, The Constitution and, and the wording in the Constitution is sufficiently vague in points um, to leave people not sure who's right about what it means. Okay, And as we read some of these points today, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and that's why we have the, the Supreme Court, because ultimately they kind of have to be the arbiter of that. They have to, they have to say, no, this is what it meant. And um, they've actually done that, and they've actually changed. Later Supreme Courts have changed what earlier Supreme Courts have said the Constitution means on things. Um, we won't even talk about it in this class, but think about the Second Amendment. I mentioned that the other day. Um, it says that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And the most extreme interpretations of that, to one end, say that that means that the government, because the Constitution limits the power of government, of the federal government, the government cannot infringe your way to keep and bear arms in any way. That seems like a pretty clear interpretation to me, right? But if you follow that thing to its end, it means that you could own, if you're rich enough, you could have your own nuclear missiles. The government can't tell you you can't, right? You can have tanks. You could have, you know, Bill Gates could have his own private army. And yet most of us go, like there's a part of our brain at least is like, well, why can't he? And then there's a part of our brain that's like, we don't want everybody having nuclear missiles, like just individuals. And so, but that's, so that's the most extreme interpretation you could take, that the government cannot limit a citizen in any way, shape, or form from owning any weapons at all. But the minute you say, well, that seems extreme, that seems like an extreme way of taking it, so I think the government should be able to limit some, some things, now you've opened up a, a, a crack in the door to where, you know, where does it stop? Can't have nuclear missiles. Okay. We can all agree on that. Well, except for the one guy who wants a nuclear missile and can afford it. Uh, we can't have... Can I have a fighter aircraft, like an F-16 or an F-15 or an F-22? If I could afford it, could I have one, fly it around? It'd be pretty sweet. No, you can't have that. Okay, okay, we're good with that. Can I have a tank, just like cruising around the neighborhood? Would that be sweet? Uh, some people do have tanks, actually. Um, no, you can't have tanks. Okay, well, can I have, I mean, surely I can have small arms. Can I have an AR-15? Yeah, but it can't be fully automatic. Why can't it be fully automatic? Because there's no purpose for it to be fully automatic. And you're thinking, uh, yeah, there is. So I could shoot it fully automatic because it's fun. <laughs> Has anybody ever shot an AR-15 or an M-16 full auto? It's a good time, right? <laughs> it's a really good time. They're fun to shoot semi-auto. Um, but you see where I'm getting at. So if we accept that the government can limit us in that way, now we're really getting... We're starting to wonder what it means, what shall not be infringed means, right? And different groups argue different things. Some will say, well, that the intent of that was so that people could hunt. And other groups say, no, no, that wasn't the intent. These are people that had just fought against their own government and pushed their own government out and started their own country. Their intent was so that people could defend themselves against a, um, an autocratic government. I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't at the convention uh, when they when they wrote these things. So as you can see, there has to be some reasonable space where we can all kind of agree this is what we think this means. We're never going to fully agree. So there has to be someone who says, okay, this means this. That's the Supreme Court. This means the government can limit you, but in only in certain ways. The government has a legitimate policing function, and letting everybody own nuclear missiles would probably make that policing function really difficult. I don't know. 
I'm probably more to the extreme side of this one, and I think that we should be able to have pretty much whatever we want. But I'm a crazy right winger when it comes to weapons. I grew up with guns, and I like them, right? All right, so here's the learning objectives of the chapter, but not everybody feels that way. I would guess most people from this community feel closer to my end of the spectrum than not, most people. But I think if you were in New York City or Los Angeles, a big chunk of that would be shifted the other direction, right? And this is a country of, of pluralistic views where people are allowed to believe differently than one another and we still need to get along. All right, so here's the things they want you to be able to do. I won't read them to you. Um, we will focus quite a bit on um, what's called the, the Commerce Clause, the power by which the federal government gets involved in commerce and what that means in today's world, what that is extended to, and the Supremacy Clause. Um, those will be the, my big focus uh, for this chapter. Um, I believe that you should read the Constitution. I'll have assignment, an assignment that involves you summarizing parts of the Constitution. I don't think enough Americans know what's in the Constitution. And uh, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm not an expert. Uh, I try to read it regularly once a year or so just to make sure I understand uh, what my rights are. I don't see myself chaining myself to the courthouse steps to fight yet, but I could see myself at some point maybe having to defend the Constitution of the United States uh, against enemies domestic. I've done it against enemies foreign. That was what I did in the military. Um, I don't know, though. I'm not saying, you know, I think we're the freest nation in the world still. Every time I start to think, well, Europe looks pretty free, then I look a little deeper. Uh, and that's not the case. There's, you know, they're pretty free until you press a certain point, and then the government says, whoa, can't do that. I was driving from Phoenix the other day, <laughs> and on the side of this, this hotel or apartment building, in big letters as you come out of the mountains into Miami, anybody notice this? Somebody has painted in huge block letters, Hillary is a crook, wake up America. And, <laughs> and whether you agree with it or not, the fact that somebody can do that there are certain places where you'd go to prison for doing that. England, you wouldn't, by the way. So when I say they're not as free as us, they're, they're pretty free still. All right. But you can't say <laughs> here, you could just say, I think the president's a total piece of crap, right? You could put that on the wall and like everybody's just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Glad you feel that way. So that is a great thing. All right. All right. So the United States Constitution is broken down into articles. And then amendments. The articles of the Constitution take up about 22 pages. Okay. Um, and the you know we tend to think the Bill of Rights are were, were passed immediately, and they were close to pass pretty immediately, but they weren't ratified till 1791, so a little after uh, the rest of things. Um, we also tend to think that of the Congress, most I mean the Congress, the the Constitution as a sacrosanct thing. It's sacred. Many Americans feel that way about it. I think I have my own set of reverence toward it. But you have to recognize that the process by which it was made was a was kind of a, a convention, right? Not kind of. It was. They call it the Constitutional Convention. And there was a lot of haggling and a lot of politics going on. People saying, well, if we can include this, can we include that? If we don't put this in, can we have this? Um, I mean, so much so that the Constitution established that slaves were not people, but for enumeration purposes, they would count as a portion of a person. Okay? So as much as I think it's a heavenly banner, I have to remember that it still was imperfect because men were involved. People were involved in its making. Um, but these people who made it were smart enough to say, we're going to put in a means by which it can be changed. Um, and so that's, that's, that's one of its strongest features, the ability of the people and the states to amend it. Okay. Um, all right. So Article 1 creates the legislative branch. It creates them first because they're the ones that make all the laws. 
We have the House of Representatives and the Senate. Does anybody know how many members there are in the Senate? 100, which is two from every state. So whether your state has 50 million people or what does Arizona have, about 6 million people? Utah has about 2 million. Vermont has about 600,000. You all have equal representation in the Senate. The House has, anybody know how many members are in the House? 435, okay. It was based on, on population. There was no limit of 435 when it was created, so it kept growing as the country grew, and finally they capped it. So now it's capped at 435 by internal rules of the House. Okay, they capped it at 435. Um, and what that, what that means is now, because before it could just grow, now it means if one state gains somebody, somebody else has to lose somebody. So it's based on your population. So a larger state like California has more representation in the House of Representatives than a smaller state like Vermont. Okay? The genius of the system is that in order for a law to pass, it has to pass both the House, which is apportioned based on population, and the Senate, which has equal apportionment. Senators are elected for six years. Members of the House are elected for two. I've heard, I've never done it, but members of the House, once they get elected, pretty much the only thing they have time to do is try to work on getting reelected. Like they're constantly campaigning. They don't have time to stop. They have to always be out there letting people know, I'm working for you. The intent of this is to make sure that the members of the House are directly answerable to the people. Right? That if they do something that the people don't like, they can be turned over within two years. Members of the Senate are meant to have a longer period of time so they could act as statesmen, if you will. People who act upon their own honor or their own beliefs regardless of what the people think. In order for something to become law, it has to pass both houses. It's a pretty genius system. It should be hard to pass a law. Right? Creating a federal law should be hard. You should have to really get buy-in from a broad group of people to make that happen. Unfortunately, we've become partisan. And so now, if you, if you go to Congress and you say, I'm going to go to Congress and I'm going to represent the state of Arizona, and you get elected, you have significant pressure from your party to support the party, even on things that you think aren't right. And it's kind of like, well, you're going to want support in these other things, right? So why don't you just support the party on this? I've seen very good people go to Congress, and I won't say they were corrupted and turned evil, but they were twisted. They had to play a game that was hard for them to, to keep right side up and, 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 you know, whatever. It was hard for them. Um, and that's even at the state level. It's hard. You're playing. Politics is, is damaging to people. <laughs> you, you end up having to sort of, you know, either be principled and get kind of run out or not be allowed to have any sort of real power or give and take, and then the giving and taking is hard to know when that stops. Okay, so Article 1 creates the legislative branch. Article 2 creates the executive branch. That's the president and the vice president. In the good old days, the first three presidents, they would have an election, and the person who got the most votes was the president, and the person who got the second most votes was the vice president. But then they stopped that and said, we're going to have a two-party system, and people are going to run together. So that's, that's I won't say it's new. It's it, pretty early on they changed that. Remember, the president's job is to execute the laws passed by the Congress. That doesn't mean the president does it himself. Okay, the president's not out there arresting people. But the president is the head of all federal executive agencies, like the FBI, which is part of the Department of Justice. Federal Bureau of Prisons, which is part of the Department of Justice. Uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security, I believe now. Right? All those things are the president's job. The way it works is Congress passes a law and then says to the president, we're going to authorize the creation of a branch of, of law enforcement to, to deal with these laws. 
Some laws are general and are handled just by general federal law enforcement. That would include the FBI and the United States Marshals Service. Okay? Others are very specific and have very specific people who, uh, who execute those laws, such as uh, the Internal Revenue Service has its own enforcement agency. And, you know, there's, there are revenue cops. The United States Postal Service actually has postal inspectors um, who inspect and, and go after mail fraud and things like that. Now, those are very small compared to, like, the FBI. But the FBI is big because it's general. So if you're ever accused of a federal crime, you'll probably be dealing with the FBI. That's usually who you're dealing with. U.S. Marshals is pretty specific, some of the things. Um, they track down fugitives, stuff like that. All right, so that's the executive branch. And then the Art Article 3 creates the judicial branch, which creates the United States Supreme Court and authorizes Congress to create other courts as needed. Some other important articles. Well, that's all the other articles. Article 4 covers the interrelationships between states. So remember when all this was conceived, the states thought of themselves as pretty much like independent countries, part of a broader confederation. And from day one, there was fighting about how strong the federal government's presence should be versus how strong the state's rules should be from very day one. You can see it in the language of the Constitution. The states created the Constitution to limit the power of federal government. And so right off the bat, guys like Alexander Hamilton were writing the Federalist Papers, writing for state or federal control of, of banking and, and money, and money. Um, I mean, from the very get-go, okay? Um, People like to think that like the, the founding fathers were all like sitting around and all in perfect accord. No, nah, these guys were, were like fighting for their beliefs. And some had stronger views of, more, of a more federalistic society and some had a much more state-oriented one. And they were all trying to protect the rights of their states. And that's what you can see that in the writing of the Constitution. The southern states um, wanted slaves to count toward their apportioning the number of representatives they would have. They didn't want to recognize them as people, but they wanted them to count in some way. So they fought for that. All right. Article 5 is amendments and how they're made. Article 6 covers the supremacy clause, which we'll talk about more. Uh, and then Article 7 covers the state ratification, how states ratified the Constitution, the process by which that was to be done. Okay. All right. So just so you know, the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution. They are the end-all, be-all when there's a question as to what does the Constitution mean right here. It's ultimately the Supreme Court that rules on that. And again, it's not usually like someone says, excuse me, Mr. Supreme Court people, what does this mean? It's more like a case goes, right, where somebody gets tried and it gets appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court, and ultimately they make a ruling by saying this is not either, either this is not what the Constitution means, or a lot of times what they say is this law that was passed, this person was arrested because of, does violate the Constitution or doesn't, and here's why. And that provides some interpretation then as to what the, 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 the Constitution means. What's challenging about, the, challenging about the Constitution is it was written more than 200 years ago. Now 230, 40 years ago. I don't think that they envisioned cell phones when they wrote the Constitution. Maybe they did, but I doubt it. Like, every single person, almost, has a computer in their pocket that... Is more powerful than like my Apple IIc I had when I was a kid. They don't think they envisioned that. And they wrote laws about things, about our rights. That, you know, the interstate highway system, the way it is right now, I don't think that was envisioned in 1790. And so we often have to take a look at the Constitution and then try to like interpret it to of uh, our modern context, all right? and that will continue to go on forever and ever. So, as the court interprets the Constitution, has anybody ever heard of this term, judicial activism? Anybody heard of that? What do you think it would mean just from the sound of it? What's your guess? Anybody want to hazard a guess? 
judicial activism versus judicial restraint. Yeah. Okay, good. So if you think about it, the justices of the Supreme Court wield enormous power. Because in essence, they could just say that law is not constitutional, so and that's it. Law can't be passed that way anymore. So some take the view that the Supreme Court should show judicial restraint, meaning they should try to like, like look at the words of the Constitution in the most literal way they possibly can, and and keep their own personal feelings and opinions out of it, and just rule according to the word of the Constitution and the word of the law. But others try to manipulate the system and get Supreme Court justices to really involve themselves in the changing of laws. Okay. Anybody ever play basketball? In basketball, referees are a major, major part of the game. They change a lot. And it's, it's, it's the way the game's ex it's expected that the refs are kind of in the middle of everything. In soccer, anybody ever play soccer? In soccer, the way you train referees is to say, you should be invisible. You should be as, as little a part of the game as possible and only call things when you have to. And I, I tend to think of the two in this way. One is like you're an important part of the thing, and the other is like you're just you're there, but you're to try to keep things going in the natural order they'll go in and just kind of let them flow. Okay? Um, uh, so up until, oh, the 1940s, there was a lot of restraint, and again, it's off and on, depends on who's in power at the time. Um, but, but FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as he was passing the New Deal uh, laws and pushing those through, uh, those were these laws after the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression that were intended to sort of get people back to working, okay? And they involved the federal government providing tons of jobs to people, um, and they provided uh, incentives for businesses to hire people. And many people were crying foul, saying, like, the federal government's getting too involved in business. And he tried to have it passed, and the, and the, the court struck it down. So then what he did is he started what he called a court packing plan. I don't know if he called it that, but his advisor, somebody coined this term. And what they did is, remember, he stayed as president for more than two terms, right? He, he was the one they made the rule, the two-term rule for. And he tried to appoint as many judges as he could who were favorable to his, his ideas. And then that legislation got passed, and it, next time it went to court, it wasn't struck down. And since then, that's kind of been the thinking. Remember what I said, Trump is trying to load the courts, and before him, Obama tried to load the courts. Um, and so this idea of, of recognizing judges are appointed by, by the president, and they're confirmed by the Senate, and in an era when you have a president and a Senate that are of the same party, you'll get some judges in there that are pretty skewed to one side. Clarence Thomas, long considered one of the most conservative judges in the history of the Supreme Court, was uh, put in by Reagan and confirmed by a Republican Senate. Um, we'll see how these other ones do. I, I think the ones that we have had recently put in seem fairly conservative but more moderate, like to more to the center, willing to go against their president's ideas and, and vote with their conscience. But we'll, I'm sure if, if I were a really hardcore liberal, I wouldn't agree with that statement. I'd be like, no, they're crazy conservative. So we'll see. All right. All right. So here's the biggie. This is the power that, uh, this is the power that Congress has. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts, provide for the common defense and the general welfare of the United States, but all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. And here's the big clause, Clause 3. So this is Section 8, Clause 3. So Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. 
All right. What does it mean that Congress will have power to regulate commerce among the several states? If you can answer it, then you've done better than many different Supreme Courts through the years. What do you think? If something is produced in one state and trucked to another state, do you think that now it becomes federal purview and Congress can make laws saying what you can and can't ship to other states? Is that regulating commerce among states? How about if one state wanted to put some sort of, sort of a excise tax on something being shipped from a, another state? Can Congress say, no, you can't put excise taxes on that? Probably. How about if something is produced in the state of Arizona, shipped on an interstate highway, say it's produced in Safford, like cotton, shipped on an interstate highway to Phoenix, where it is sold to people in Phoenix, does Congress have any right to regulate that transaction? Right. So through the years, it's become broader and broader and given federal government more and more power. Now, anything transported on, a, on an interstate highway system, which is maintained with federal funds, is interstate commerce, even if it's produced and sold all in one state. How do they limit guns? And say you must have it federally licensed because it's interstate commerce. There is a state... Montana or Wyoming, Montana, um, where they have specifically written a statute into their state law saying, in essence, the federal government will have no control over firearms produced in the state of Montana and sold to citizens of the state of Montana. And that hasn't been challenged by the federal government yet. I guess you have to be careful how you transport them. You can't transport them through the mail. You can't transport them, right? You can't use any federal. So well, here's what's happened, guys. Over the years is the initial intent was that the states would be sovereign, uh, except in certain things. And those certain things are outlined in the Constitution. Actually, the Constitution limits the power of the federal government to certain things, right? And then all other rights are to the states. That's the Tenth Amendment. But in time, the federal government has done one of two things. They've expanded the power via the Commerce Clause and the Supremacy Clause, which we'll look at in a minute. And two, um, they have expanded their power by giving money to the states to use for various things and then putting strings with that money. So our schools are partially funded by federal dollars. So when the Department of Education comes and says, we want everybody to take this standardized test, and one state says, well, we don't want to do the standardized test. They'll say, fine, then you won't be eligible for our funding. But you don't have to. We can't make you. Right? It's kind of like the power your parents have over you when you're a kid. Right? Like, they own the car. I never license the car in my kid's name when they're teenagers. I, it's my car. Yeah, you get to use it pretty much whenever you want, but I always have the power to revoke that, right? And then I say, I'm not making you. You can choose that. You can choose to do whatever you want, right? So th that's, that's kind of where we are today. The federal government has a great deal of power because progressively over time, the Commerce Clause has been interpreted to mean broader and broader control of pretty much all commerce. I mean, now we sell things on the Internet. That's all interstate. Um, and because the expansion of government, federal funding of state projects. All right, Article 7. The Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. You're like you lost me at the whole notwithstanding business. That got confusing. All right. What do you think this means? What's the second highest thing we have to follow? The Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof. So all federal laws that are constitutional 
are preeminent above state laws. Again, when this was written, it was thought that the federal government would only have a few laws in very specific areas. But now the federal government has lots and lots of laws. So if the federal government made a law about murder, like say they decided that, um, that the death penalty was unacceptable and made a law saying there would be no death penalty in any of the states, that would be preeminent. The states would have to challenge that, they could, to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court could make a ruling. But in the meantime, they couldn't execute anybody. Right? And there kind of was a federal moratorium on, on death penalty for, for years, for about 20 years. And then that was lifted, and then some states have gone back, back to you know Texas, forget about it, they're just going to execute you. Uh, and some states really haven't gone back to it. All right, so remember the Commerce Clause and the Supremacy Clause. Those are big deals. Okay, you might want to read through those sections in the book if you haven't yet. If a law directly conflicts with federal law, the state law is invalid. This is called preemption. And then they ask all these questions. This is what the court's supposed to do when they're looking at should this law be preempted. A lot of times, a well-crafted state law can sort of slip in between the lines of a federal law. Right? It has to be that they are in direct conflict with each other before you preempt the state law. So if the state law people write the law in such a way as to say, look, it's not, it's not getting you to disobey the federal law. A challenge we've had in recent years is where the federal government, through executive order, says we're not going to, we're not going to execute this law. We've had this with immigration, where they've said we're just not going to arrest certain people, and then certain states say, well, we're going to, we're still going to exercise federal law, and we're going to let if, if if we determine someone to be an illegal immigrant, we will detain them, and then we'll turn them over to the federal government, and the federal government saying. So in essence, you have the federal government saying we won't detain them for these for these offenses, and some states saying we are going to detain them, and then we'll turn them over to the federal government, and you can decide whether you want to let them go, but we're doing our job. That happened here in Arizona, right? Other states are saying we're not going to exercise any of these things. We're going to create sanctuary cities, a place where we're going to thwart federal attempts to exercise federal law. And so... Right, you know, something's going to have to come to a head here, a head here at some point, right? And and that's that's the way it's laid out right now. All right, whoops, I cut off the 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 Earth Amendment. It's the first. All right, so this is the Bill of Rights. These are the first ten amendments of the Constitution. You probably learned about them in school at some point. Um, okay, somebody who brought up the Constitution, can you read to me the wording of the bill of the First Amendment of the Constitution? If it's sometimes if you just put in Constitution, it just has all the articles and doesn't have. You might have to type in Bill of Rights if it doesn't show it to you. What's that? Yeah. What's it say? For First Amendment. Yeah. Go ahead. That's that's the first article. I want the First Amendment. Okay, go ahead. Good. So the Articles of the Constitution establish government, the federal government, and how it be organized. The amendments, the first ten amendments, limit the federal government. They say this is what, no, so it starts with Congress shall make no law. Respecting freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of petition. Redress of grievances. All right, so why do you think we include this in a study of the Constitution for business purposes? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion. What parts of business do you think might be covered under this Okay, marketing. 
What am I allowed to say and not allowed to say in marketing? Am I allowed to lie about my competitor? Actually, you can. It's not a crime, but you could face a civil suit from your competitor, right, if you slander them. And that's probably the way it should be taken care of. The government shouldn't be involved in that, but individuals should be able to protect their rights. Okay? So if you think about um, some of the things, how about the, 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 the gay couple and the cake bakery that we just listened to a little portion of, that, of the oral arguments? He's claiming it's freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Because freedom of speech might be freedom from speech, like saying, I don't have to say certain things. You can't force me to say that. Right? They've already established that you can't force kids to say the Pledge of Allegiance in school. That's freedom from speech, <laughs> from being compelled to say certain things. Okay. So that's what the First Amendment's about. What's the Fourth Amendment? Does someone have that? Go ahead. All right. It's a little hard because it's written in 1790s language, right? But not really. It's pretty clear. We have this one. They even put it in the book, which is interesting. They put privacy, or privacy if you're English, but privacy. Does it say that you have a right to privacy? It says you have a right against un undue searches and seizures, unreasonable, to be secure in your effects. And again, who does this limit? The government. But they've invoked this at times. Say, um, you guys know what paparazzi are? So if a paparazzi uh, climbs up to a third-story balcony so they can see down in your yard, or say a, a famous movie star's yard, and the famous movie star is uh, romantically involved with somebody who's not their spouse and they take pictures of them, the question is, can they do that? Because somebody would say, you, you were in public view. Yeah, I had to go up three stories, but I could see you. You were out in the open. And someone else said, I was in my yard. And so the courts have said, you have a right to privacy. It says so in the Fourth Amendment. Uh, it doesn't say that. Right? And so here's where we get to this sort of like strict construction, uh, or, or, or con const not construction, but strict construing of the Constitution. What specifically does it say? And, or we get to the like, well, what's implied there? It's also where we get to, does it really just limit the government or does it limit all people? I don't know. For most of us, the idea that somebody climbed up to the third story to take pictures of you in your backyard seems a little disconcerting, right? We like to believe our yard, if we put up a, a wall or a fence, is kind of our safe zone. Um, but I'm not sure the Constitution guarantees you that right, especially from another citizen. Again, I think that might be more of a tort case where you could sue them individually. Um, and certainly the states could make statutes saying this is an invasion of privacy. Um, anyway, so that, that's where this comes in. So the fifth, who's got the Fifth Amendment? All right, so the government can't force you to, to be a witness against yourself. They can't take away your property without just compensation, which, if you read that right, means they can take away your property as long as they have just compensation. Uh, it also means you have to go, there has to be due process, meaning if you're going to have to go to court, there's going to have to be a process they follow that you're allowed to know about so that you can defend yourself. Okay? Um, the 
So when I have a customer write me a bad check, I can't just like call the sheriff and have the sheriff throw them in jail. Instead, I call the sheriff. The sheriff says, we've got a form. Come down, fill out the form. How much do they owe you? Blah, 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 blah. I fill that out. I turn it in. The sheriff's department then sends them a letter that says, you are accused of theft by check, which is what it's called in Arizona. You have, I think it's 30 days to remit payment to the person that you wrote the bad check to. And if you don't, then action will be taken against you. So there's a process that we go through that's consistent every time, right? We've all heard the, the scary stories of rogue cops, you know, just deciding they're going to take the law into their own hands. And, it's, and then if that rogue cop is in, in league with a rogue judge, we're in real trouble, right? Then the government has all sorts of power. Um, so this is meant to limit that, to say the government's power is limited to following due process. And this gets used all the time in business. Okay. Um, sixth is a right to trial by jury. You can actually waive that. You can say, I, I want to have a summary trial where the judge makes the decision. But, but you have the right to the trial by jury and can choose whether or not you want to take that right. And then the 14th Amendment uh, is an interesting one because not only does it talk more about due process like the Fifth Amendment, uh, it says that the states are also required to give people due process. Uh, but also equal protection. And that's where we get a lot of our current notions about discrimination. In essence, the idea is that all people are due equal protection under the law, regardless of their color, regardless of their gender, regardless of their lots of things. It doesn't say sexual orientation, by the way, in the 14th Amendment, but that has become in many states. Um, and if you think about it, is there any reason a person of, of a different sexual orientation shouldn't still have the same protections offered by the law? Probably not, right? Like, so the intent is that all people, regardless of anything, are, are due protections from the government by the law. That's the intent, okay? And so often things get ruled on by saying, is this person getting equal protection? Right? This is why you can't discriminate against um, a person for their housing. Again, now we have individuals saying, I don't want to make someone a cake. And you have certain parts of the government saying they're not having equal protections. And other people are saying that doesn't apply to the individual. It applies to the federal government and limits its power. And so these are the arguments that get hashed out in the courts. And that's all I have for today. Um, I know the lecture parts are hard. That's why I try to limit them. Um, so hopefully it was a little bit interesting. Have a great day. If you have not yet submitted the pre-read questions for Chapter 4, those were technically due on Friday, right, because that was when we were supposed to do this, but we didn't do it till today. So if you haven't done them yet, get them in by today, okay? I'm sorry, man.